Shay Shahara, and I'm here today to show you an easy way to paint a rose in acrylics. First, I want to show you the background and the way I prepared uh, the background for the rose. The box we're going to be working on is over here, and you can see that modeled background look. It is a simple paper mache box, and I didn't finish the bottom here just so you would be able to see that. The top I have already base coated, and that was done in antique rose. What I'm going to be using are these two products here. One is called Neutral Gel. It's a wonderful product from Delta that can be mixed with your paints and then can be used for any number of things uh, similar to what I'm going to be doing or to antique or even to stain wood. But uh, I've used this color right here. It's called uh, Pink Frosting. And I'm going to be mixing these two together about half and half. So let me put out a little bit of the Pink Frosting. And you won't need a lot. And I'm going to put out an approximately equal amount of the gel. Now the gel is a very, very thick medium. You need to be aware of that. It, it, that's why it's called a gel, because it is so thick. And what I'm going to do is simply mix these two together with my palette knife. Now you want to take enough time to mix these thoroughly. As I said before, with the gel, and you could use any color of acrylic paint, mixing it with the gel and creating the kind of look we're working on today, or you would be able to stain wood with it. It works beautifully uh, in staining uh, wood, uh, and you can also use it to antique with. Now I'm just going to apply this with my sponge brush, and it looks real thick. Brushing the top on, brushing it onto the top of the box, I'm going to cover the entire top. I'll pick up my plate here and I can bring it to the box so you'll be able to see this a little better. You don't have to paint it on beautifully. In other words, I'm not trying to make wonderfully smooth uh, brush strokes in, in one direction. But I do want to cover the entire top. Back again and get it on this side over here. And it's all right that it's not perfectly even. There's, it can be a little heavier coverage in some areas than in others. Now, over here I have some plastic wrap that I've already taken off the roll. And I'm going to wad that up to make it kind of crinkled and just lay it on the top, pressing it down like so. Do it with the other piece. Again, crinkling it. And finally, I have third piece. You'll be able to use uh, transfer paper. You'll trace your pattern and transfer it to the top of the box. We're going to be painting a rose much larger than the one uh, that's on the box, so you'll be able to see it a little bit better. I'll just move my paints off here to the side. Before we begin the rose, I want to show you a little bit about the construction of a rose. I think it's really important. As a decorative painter, I know right off in the beginning. It was one of the things that I wanted to do was to learn how to paint a rose. And I found very quickly that I had to first learn the construction of a rose. And to be truthful, when I first began, I painted a rose every day. And I probably painted some of the ugliest roses you would ever want to see. So don't be discouraged. It's probably one of the hardest flowers to paint. And uh, that's why I try to really simplify it here for you. This is a very construed rose. I drew it uh, purposefully so that you would be able to understand a rose. <laughs> I want you to see the rose painters and all of us teachers talk all the time about the bowl of the rose. Well, I decided that it was high time that somebody actually drew a bowl so you would understand 
what we're talking about. This, of course, would be the rim going around here, and this is the base of the bowl. This is inside the bowl. You hear us talking about now we're going to paint inside the bowl. That's where we're going to begin with yours. These are the back petals, and here I have two petals that are wrapping around to the front of the bowl from this side and from this side. This is a total petal in this area and also over in this area. Then from this point down, the petals are just single, large petals. I call this area right in here the point of dimension of the rose. It's the part of the rose that should feel as though it's furthest forward, closest to you, in other words. And it's the area where all of a sudden you have a change in the way you paint it. When you're painting the rose, all of the shading, all of the floated shading that we'll be putting on will be pointing downward if you're working above this line. Now this line, of course, is imaginary, but when you load your brush, you will find that all of the paint will be in this area pointing downward. Now once you pass this line, once you go over the line, all of the paint or the shading color is going to be pointing upward. It'll be going in this direction. And I think this is the part where most people get confused, whether they're doing a stroke rose or a constructed rose that we're going to be doing here, petal by petal. I hope that'll uh, help you in understanding a rose a little bit better, even when you are doing just the stroke rose. That, that rule that I just explained to you follows in all cases. I'll set my rose over here. Let's turn this around. And this is going to be the rose we're going to be painting. Delta has a wonderful new product out. It's called Color Float. And I want to use that in my water. I need to explain to you that this is a blending medium, but it is never put in your paint. You want to only use it in the water. It's kind of like a water conditioner, I guess would be the best way to describe it. So we're going to be putting it in your water container. Now this particular kind of brush basin is divided into two parts. And on the one side over here, which is where I'm going to be working primarily, uh, there's about 10 or 12 ounces of uh, water in there. So I'm going to be adding 10 or 12 drops of color float. If you're going to be using this product regularly, then you want to pre-measure your, your water one time only. And then from that point, you'll always be able to approximate how many drops you're going to use. We generally fill our brush basins to the same level every time. So you want to think that you're going to be putting in 10 or 12 drops. And I'll just drop it in in I think that I got two right there. I think you'll be able to see it as it disperses through the water. That's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. <laughs> now it wouldn't matter if I went over like thirteen or fourteen drops. That still is perfectly all right. Uh, or I could be under a couple of drops. You wouldn't want to put in, let's say, twenty drops. You'd really notice the difference. Once the color float is in your water, just forget about it. Load your brush as you always do, rinse as you always have. It, there is no smell, it, there's no odor to it. Uh, your water feels the same, it doesn't feel slick or uh, slimy. And uh, it's amazing though what this particular product is going to do to our uh, painting. Now let me get my palette of color over here. Sorry, wrong one. We tried to put these out early to save on time. Here we go. Now for me, I'm going to be painting this rose upside down and backwards, but for you, it's going to look right side up. I'm going to rinse my brush in the water plus the color float. And I'm just bringing this over here once for you to be able to see this. You need to come to your towel and blot your brush. Get the shine out of your brush. Blot your brush just like this. Then turn it over and be sure to blot it on the other side. Because of the color float, you need to blot your brush thoroughly, not just one quick blot. Once you've done that, you can uh, proceed as you would ordinarily. Now when I paint this rose, I begin inside the bowl. And so what I'm going to do with that water I just picked up is to come in here and dampen this area of the bowl. Now I don't have to be rushed because the neat part is, because of the color float, that's going to stay wet for me for a little while. 
I'll come in here, pick up water again, blot my brush as I explained before, and we're going to come in. This rose, by the way, was base coated with sachet. I'm going to come in and my first dark shading color is going to be the antique rose. I'm going to blend this on my palette just a little bit. This is my way of blending. I put the corner of my brush in the paint, do on one side, flip it over, and blend on the other side. Very short, choppy blending strokes. And in this way, I'm getting the paint to go from side to side on the brush. I have paint, paint and water, and then just water. And in addition, I've got the brush so it's loaded from underneath to the top. So I have a full load on both sides of my brush. Now, I'm going to come back in here and start at the bottom of the bowl. One of the things you need to keep in mind, and I've seen a lot of acrylic roses painted this way, people come in and they float their line of color in the bowl of the rose like this, and they consider it done. Actually, the shading in the inside of a rose bowl does not go in that kind of a curve. It actually curves up and out this way. So while we have that in there, and because we put that color float with the water underneath, I'm going to take that now and walk it out using my paint to bring it up higher by padding. And I do have a kind of a choppy technique that I work with, pulling it up and out of the bowl, keeping it dark down towards the bottom where we first floated the color, but using my brush to pat and pull it up. Now it shouldn't be as dark, of course, at the top as it is down in this area. But you want to take your time to really get that out. And uh, if you have worked in acrylics before, you know that usually you can't fool around with acrylics this long and have them come out that smoothly. That's the kind of thing that the color float helps uh, in your painting technique. I'm going to rinse my brush out. And I'm going to come over here and take just a little bit smaller brush because I want to do these back petals. Our first step will be to go around the entire rows and to shade all of the areas using this antique rose color. Now we're going to have to make it dark, this petal dark where it goes behind the bowl and where it goes behind this petal. When you're putting your color on like this, I want you to begin thinking about floating an area with shading rather than putting on a line of shading. I think that makes a big difference in making your painting look much more realistic. So rather than just floating a line of color, notice how I pat, blend, and pull it up onto the petal. Now, I'm not going to be able to cover all of my pencil lines here. The reason being, I made them extra dark so you'd be able to see each one of the segments. Ordinarily, you would put that on very lightly just for you to be able to see it in your painting. I did, of course, I told you that I had base coated the rose in sachet. But what I did, of course, was to do the entire outside of the rose, then come back in once I had it all base coated and put my dividing lines in. Now, we're going to come down into this. This is a very deep V-shaped area right here. I'm going to come down into that area with this. This is my first shading. And I'm going to pull it up out of that V-shape in a long, the outside edge of the bowl here, letting it disappear and fade away out on to the petal itself. I'm going to come back again. Notice how I haven't gone back into my water at this point. I still have enough of it in there to allow me to do this. Again, this is another kind of a V shape down in here. And we're going to pull it back up out onto the rows. And because I have that clean little corner on my brush here, see, I can use that corner to make this fade up and out and onto the petal. And you always want to do that. Always be thinking of shading an area. I'm going to rinse out my brush. 
Now, I hope you were paying attention and noticed all the ways from here down, the color in my brush was always pointing downward. Now we're at that point of dimension that I talked about right in here. And this is the reason you can change. Uh, when you go below this point, the color is going to be pointing up. Watch what's going to happen as I work around those two petals that wrap around the front of the bowl. My color is still pointing down at this point. I'm going to have shading right here. And watch. As I work, I would actually have the brush go around and come underneath. Okay? So it actually turns direction right at that point. Now I can't paint it that way because I'm not left-handed, but I can come and put shading underneath going the opposite direction and then you'll understand what I'm telling you. In other words, now all of a sudden from the, the paint is no longer the shading is going down and all of a sudden now we make this turn and it's going to be going up. I'm going to do that to the opposite side over here. Again, doing this kind of patting and pulling as I'm working. And I need to add this down underneath here, like so. Now right in this area here, it's almost solid shading color right in this area here, and it should be because we have shading both above and below right there. Now I'm going to come back and switch back up to that little bit larger brush. Continuing with this same color, you'll notice I'm not working with a wet palette. I know many painters do, but with that color float in my brush, I can just work so quickly, I don't have to have a wet palette. Now, now we're on the lower side here, so we're going to be working uh, upward. Let me float my color here on this large petal first. Again, remember that you're floating color in an area, so be sure to pull it out onto the petal. Keep working along this other side until you go right over to this edge. Again, pulling the color out, walking it out just a little bit. And don't worry about if you have, um, that it looks a little uneven. I'll come up and do the next petal. Right along this edge. And it's going to go underneath the bowl and underneath this petal on your left. Again, be sure to get that color out onto the petal just a little bit so it's not a hard outline around the bottom. And you see where I kind of went over a little bit right there? I know I'll be covering that up later, but just to show you how neat this is because I have the color float down there, I have enough time to come back with just a little bit of water and color float in my brush and clean that off. Just right along there. Okay, let's continue and get the last of the shading here. We'll go under the bowl on this side, up and along my petal right here. You can use the paint that's on the back side of the brush if you need to. And remember, you can always go back and pick up a little more paint. And I have enough left in my brush to come down this side over here. This is the very first step in shading. And again, I have to keep reminding people of this, most acrylic painters float their color on, but they don't pull it out on to the area that they're shading. 
and you need to be thinking of that. You need to bring it out further than just a line of color or a line of paint and underneath the bowl once again. Now that basically <coughs> is all of our first shading. I'm going to be going now to the next color <coughs> and this is a beautiful new color from Delta. It's called Wild Rose. I really like it a lot. Let me explain to you what we're going to do next. <coughs> Shadows in nature will follow the outline of your piece, just as you see right here. We just followed the outline of the petal above. What we're going to do now is to go back in and darken a second time. The dark is going to cover a smaller area and it's going to be, of course, one shade or two shades darker. We're going to do the bowl. I'm going to be putting it on the same way, pulling it up only perhaps this far not all the way. This is the second dark. And all of these areas where there are small triangles, right in here, right here, all of these petals that have little triangles, I hope you can see what I mean by a triangle, it would be that area. Shadows will ordinarily follow the line or fall in triangles on a subject such as this. I'll come back and pick this up in my brush. Once again, loading it the way I, I like to do it. We can start back here in these little dark triangles in the back. And notice how I use the water side of my brush in order to have that blend out onto the petal. I take advantage of that as often as I can. So you don't want these to be harsh little triangles. They have to actually blend out onto your petal. And we have several of them across the back here. So, and I'm going to turn my work just a little in order to get the brush in that corner. Now, the triangles do not have to touch each other. That's important. Uh, what will happen is, once again, you'll just have that petal outlined. If you paint them like this and don't allow them to touch each other, your eye will actually connect them for you so that you don't want to pull it all the way across. We have a little triangle here and another one up here. Again, I'm trying not to let them touch. Now there are occasions when you're painting an item that's just so small and you're trying to stick these triangles in that you may have to have them touch. But if, if it's at all possible, and it is in almost all instances, you can just work like this to get it in there. Okay, now we're down to the bowl area. And we're gonna do the same thing that we did in the beginning. I'm gonna dampen this area. Now this is the only part of the rose that I pre-dampen. I don't do it in the other areas. I'll pick up my paint. And remember I said we're going to make this darker, which we're doing right now, but a little smaller than the original color we put on. It still has to be drawn up out of the bowl. You can't just paint a line of color down in there. And notice how I just keep patting it. If you notice these lines right here that are coming into it, flatten your brush down in your hand and you'll get rid of those. You have to hold your brush as low and flat as you can so you don't create a lot of those lines. It's okay to have this patchy look, but you don't want to have all these lines showing up in your painting. The lower you hold the brush in your hand and flatter to the surface, the less likely it is that they will appear. And we're gonna bring this color up just about this high. Now, if you want to, this is just a judgment call, you could go back later after this has dried and reapply that a second time. Now we have lots of little triangles we have to look at. We have these two great big guys on either side of the bowl here, and I am going to darken them down. When you're doing this, when you're doing a second or even going on and doing a third or a fourth shading, each time you shade, it will get a little bit darker and a little bit smaller. We're only using two colors today to shade with. But that has to gradually come up and fade into the first shading area. In other words, you don't want to make it as big as the first shading color because you'll simply co uh, cover it up. 
Now, on these petals, we have triangles at this end. I'm going to have to turn my work for a minute again in order to be able to get this in here. And I have one right down here at the bottom of the bowl. Right there. Can I show you here? Uh, this triangle is a kind of a long shape, just like that. Now, there is a triangle, if you see it, right at this end here. We aren't going to paint that one because this petal is on top of this one. So we need to paint the triangle below, right here. In other words, if we put two dark triangles right together, this would be very confusing to the eye and you would think that this was one large petal. So the one that's underneath is the more important one. We want this one to appear lighter than that. I'm going to come back in and use the water side of my brush just to fill that in. Whoops. We have another triangle over here. After a while, uh, your eye will begin to see these little triangular areas, and this is something I do do in all of my patterns. I always draw these in. I always try to ink these in for my students so that they're aware of where they should be placed, and they don't have to guess. But after a while, your eye begins to see these automatically, and you know right where to go to put them in. And of course, the triangle shapes themselves are all different. Really, no two are alike. Let me just move on over to here. We have one up at this end, and one underneath the bowl here. And this petal is the same as the, uh, this one. Right here, there, there's a triangle, but we're not going to use it because we have the one below. So we'll color that one in right there. And then in order to tie in these colors, we're going to come back and add just a little bit of this dark color shading. Not a lot. Now, don't fill in the whole line here. Just touch it here and there, and that will help to relate to the rest of the shading on the rose. Okay. Basically, that's all of the shading that we're going to be doing on the rose. Let me come over here, get another palette that I have ready. Not that one. Yeah, it is. I need to add some pink frosting to this. This is going to be our first light uh, value. Still working as we did before. I'm going to come in now and I'm going to lighten the top edge of the bowl of my rose simply by stroking along the top. And you do want to pull that down into the bowl just a little bit. You can go back then and just use a little bit of the color that's left over. And I call these cloud strokes. Don't go down too far with them, but they're to simulate petals here in the background. And I always tell my students, now don't make them look like little McDonald's golden arches, you know, going around the top here. They're very subtle and they don't go down too far. I need to switch back to that smaller brush again. And we're going to lighten the outside edge of those back petals. Just in the center of this one, because I don't want to go back and cover up the dark that I already have on there. Notice how frequently I use that clean edge on my brush. To clean up areas and make them fade away. And we'll just do it one more time to the third petal. 
going along the outside edge. Notice, by the way, I start kind of small on the chisel edge and then flatten out and let it get big. And then as I'm coming over to the shadow side, I'm going to let it get narrow again and just kind of disappear. Now I can switch back to my big brush. We're going to come back now and complete the front of the bowl. I'm going to come around the front like so, pulling my color along as I go. Now this is something I see real often in rose painting. People get it this far and they wonder what's wrong with it. They know there's just something slightly out of whack. And let me show you what it is. You must connect this line that you have just painted on here with the color you've painted back here. So you can't just put this on here. You must start up in this area and pull a line down and give yourself the edge of the bowl. Your eye has to see it come from here down through here across the front and then it has to come back up and connect back up here for you. If you don't do that, if you don't connect the front to the back, then it always looks strange. You just can't quite figure out what's wrong. So it's important to have these two little connecting lines here and here. And don't make them too wide. Don't let them get to be too, too thick. I'd like that one just a tad thinner right there. Okay, we're going to come down now and highlight the outside edge of all the petals that we have left. I'm going to start here because I know I want to just put a little bit on the side of the bowl right here. And also on the side over here. I'm going to also put a little bit along the bottom edge of the bowl right here. We're going to do the outside edge of this petal. And this is going to go all the ways around down to the point and back again. We're going to repeat the same thing on the other side. Now notice how I'm able to do both of these petals with one brush load of paint. That's really kind of hard to believe if you're used to not having color float. You're used to this not being possible. And I swing around this outside edge a little bit more. And remember this is my very first light. I'm going to go back and lighten this even more. So I'll get that color on there. And again, I'm trying to do areas here. I'm not trying to do just a floated line along the outside edge. And I want to move along quickly here with these petals. So let me just get it on. See how I'm able to use both sides of the brush, the paint on both sides because I took the time to load it that way. And finally we'll do this last petal. Now look at that. I did these last four or five petals here, again, with one brush filled with paint. It just saves so much time in your painting. It's just amazing what it does. Okay. All I'm going to do now is come back, picking up a little bit of the light ivory for my strong highlight. And this is not going to go on everywhere. I usually put it on these curves because that helps to separate the petals even more. I'll pick a couple of spots in the bowl and add this on. Don't connect them. It's just like the shadows. Your eye will do that for you. Pick a spot or two along the front rim of the bowl. that in. And I always really, really lighten these guys right here where they come around to the front. Remember I said that's going to be the thing that you're going to feel is closest to you. So let me get that on these. 
we'll add some up in here again just to add a little stronger highlight and I just pick spots at random I don't have any set area where I add these but notice how they help to lift the flower and give it more depth by adding these little highlights we have two areas here that will be really nice to add them on because they feel like they're coming toward you so it's nice to strengthen that feeling by making it light light will feel as though of course it's coming towards you and where we do the dark areas they recede and feel as though they're going away from you now we could keep putting color on here and actually getting up to pure white this is an off-white color but we could get up to pure white and each time I would make this a little bit smaller now all we need to do is to come back in and add our center dots and this color is just one shade darker than the wild rose this is called dusty mauve and I'm going to come in here and just put these down in the center I do messy dots this happens to be a large round brush sometimes I use the corner of a flat brush they're going to be in a mound in the center then you just rinse out your brush we're going to pick up some antique gold and we're going to add that right over the first dot just here and there rinse again and we're going to come back and pick up a little bit of that light ivory in order to be able to add a few even stronger ones now you don't need to add quite as many of these and if they mash into the ones beneath that's just fine they'll look more real and then of course if you overdo any one color go back with some of the other two colors and cover that up we're going to let this sit for just a minute and um, it can be drying while I show you how we're going to do the leaves for that I'll set that here I have another palette all ready to go and these are the colors that I used in the leaves now the leaves have been base coated with uh, village green paint and we're going to be shading these the technique is going to be the same as it was on the rose we're going to be shading these one step at a time and once you get on to that particular style or technique of painting you'll find it's very very easy I'm going to first go to the dark green that you see here and since this leaf is drawn to fall underneath that one we're going to shade it dark right along this area here we're going to go underneath the rose now I've laid this on kind of the way we usually float color in a line and you see what I want instead of that line like that as you're working and putting it on is to work that out into a darker area so I get my brush real low and do that padding again and pulling and getting that to come out from that line so that it actually is a nice shaded area still continuing to follow the general shape but you see how much bigger that becomes just by working it out and again you're able to do that because of the color float now I'm going to go down the vein line right here and I try to draw my most of my leaves just as you see these it's about a two-third one-third leaf so you can see this side which is my dark side is only one-third and then the rest of it will be my light side now all of these leaves would be painted exactly the same this one of course would be dark here and under here and along that vein line likewise this one here let me just get this on here I think we have time to show this to you I will do this one it's just the same again don't just lay it on there in a line come back and take some time to pat and pull that out so you have a nice gradation of color and it is an area
uh, come back and apply color down this vein again. And by the way, never let that go right to the tip of the leaf. You don't want to pull this color down so far that you split your leaf in two. Okay. Now, just like the rose, leaves have triangles also. I'm going to come back here and pick up, this is forest green. Be easy to remember, forest green and forest gump. Forest green is a really pretty deep color. And this is going to be our second shading color. We're going to come back in here and we have a nice deep triangle. Got another one right down here. Are you beginning to see some of these areas where you have triangles? And remember, as I said before, the triangles, you want to paint them, but they don't need to touch each other. Let me come up in here and over here. Now, in this area right here, we are also going to go back down the vein line and darken it. See how often I use that wet side of my brush to do some of my blending and softening of my colors? Looks kind of messy at this point, I will admit. You just have to keep going blindly forward. <clears throat> now we're going to come over in here and I'm going to lighten this area. And this is called pale mint green. It's just barely, barely green. And we're going to be pulling that down the light side. It's going to almost look white to you in the camera, but it really does have a, a green cast to it. Now this is the light area. Remember I said we're going to do an area rather than uh, just a line. So you want to use this now to pull this out into the area. I also lighten the tip just a little bit along this edge and along the tip. You can even lighten this back edge if you want to. Just ever so slightly. Always keeping this lighter than you would this back edge. Now I need to feel that, and while it's still pretty damp, you see, because of that uh, color float in the water. While that's drying for the next step, I'm going to move over to the original, the middle one there, and darken it. I can come back up in here. Nice, nice triangle right here. Do you see that little triangular shape right there? Don't do anything at this end because this leaf is on top of that one, so we want it to stand out more. We will add some dark along the vein line here and again have it fade away at the bottom. <clears throat> we aren't going to add a triangle here because we're going to have one later on underneath right in this area here. So we don't have to have one at that end. I will tie it in with a little dark though just along this area here. And again, I don't make that uh, a full line of color there. We'll put the pale mint green on. And I am going to turn it. It just makes it a little bit easier for me to go from my left to right. And it'll be another opportunity for you to see how I lower my brush once I get the line on there and work it out into an area. And remember, if you end up with a hard edge, say like this right here, come back and just use that other side of your brush to clean it off there. The color float in the water gives you lots of time to play with your painting. And being an old oil painter, well, 
an experienced oil painter, let's say. <laughs> that was where I started. Um, we always used to putz and play in our paint quite a bit. I am going to lighten this edge because remember this one is in, on top of the other one. So I'm going to do that. And once again, I'll lighten the tip area. Come back and do this edge for a short ways. Okay, now, going to come back once again because I have lightened it, but I don't really have a highlight as yet. And so this is my next step. Lighter. This I'm using the light ivory. This is just a little bit lighter. And my area, and it is an area, is going to be smaller. So I want to blend that in just a wee bit. If you want to, you can go back and lighten the tip again. A lot of painting, you know, is your own personal judgment, your own personal call. So anytime you see that you feel that it's not light enough once it dries or not dark enough, there's no cardinal law that says you can't go back and fix it up. Uh, so you can go back and put it in again. The other thing I do is to add a little bit of my antique gold. And I add that generally in this area right here on my rose. And I'll put it on both of these at the same time. And again, because of the color float, I have time to put it on there, wipe out my brush. And even under these lights, it has not dried so quickly that I can't come back in and blend the edge off. So this color that I'm putting on here, I call a tint. It's the kind of thing you don't really notice until someone points it to you. It should not be real strong. What I, the way I finish up the, this part of my leaf is to come back and I'm picking up this deep color. This again is the I'm wild rose. I'm running out of room here on this little palette. So I'll blend up here along the edge. Make sure I've blotted it really good. Get this out of the way here for you. And I almost always put an accent color at the tip of my leaf. This is one of the colors we used in the rose. It's always a strong color. And generally, I will pick one or two other areas along with the tip in order to add this. Let me come over here and do this one. And I'll turn it once again. This side just seems to be my bugaboo with the painting upside down and backwards. I can't seem to get my wrist to flip around. I'm going to go back and strengthen this just a little right here. And again, I'll clean that up with just a little bit of the brush and right along here. One of the neat places to put this accent color is always where two things overlap. And so I'm going to come right here and put just a little tiny bit of it right in this area. And Zingo, that just picks that up and really, really makes it feel like it's on top right along here. Okay. Now we're going to come back, and ordinarily uh, I would be doing this with a liner brush, but these are big leaves, so I'm going to be using my large round brush to put the veins in. And I'm going to go back and choose my first shading color. Now, the vein is going to go in the dark area. I do not put it on the line between the light and dark side. I move up into the dark area ever so slightly and pull it. Veins should be real subtle. You don't want to be able to point them out. But they need to be there. And sometimes I like it to feel as though, is that a vein or not? They're going to follow the contour of the bottom of the leaf. If we could see the bottom of this leaf, it would come around this way. So my veins are going to go that way. 
They should never be pulled to touch the outside edge. I'm going to turn my work just a little bit here and come down this way with it, pulling a little bit further. Now even when I paint large, large leaves, and I mean I've done outdoor signs where the leaves, each one is probably as big as this entire piece of paper I'm working on, uh, I still only put three or four veins. You don't want them to be as veiny as they are in real life. And basically, your little leaf is done. Now that the rose is here, time to dry. This is kind of what I call the secret of my rose. When I got my rose done the first time to this point, I thought, jeepers, that looks pretty chalky and white to me, and I really want it to have a little more life. Gold, and I made a light wash with that very, very light and subtle. Probably even a little bit lighter than the uh, uh, tents that I put in the leaf. And I came back to my rose, and it doesn't matter which side you put it on, but I came in and I added little touches of this to my rose here and there, and I covered about two-thirds of it, even going into the bow and up on the upper petals. Now again, I did all of that. Don't wash it over the complete rose. I come back, you see, and use my brush. And again, because of the color float, I have time to do that. It's such a wonderful, wonderful revolutionary product. I just can't say enough about it. It has just changed painting for me immensely. Now, we have that on that side giving us some bright light. Let's move over here where we're going to put a little shading, and the shading in this case is going to be lavender. Same idea, but only one third of that side. So I'll come over here, add this in here and there, and better that you should put it on lightly and say to yourself, oh, I can go back and put more on, than to get it on so heavy that you're worried about covering it up. If you should put it on too heavy and not have time to get it off or not realize that you've done that, I would say just let it dry completely and then make yourself a very, very light wash of sachet. Remember that was our base color that we had underneath that we started with? And go back in and do a wash, the wash of sachet over the top of it. That's really basically how uh, we paint this simplified rose. I hope it helped you to understand it just a little bit better. I'd like to go over to the box and point out a few additional things to you so you'd be able to complete it on your own. Uh, the roses, of course, were painted identical, and all the leaves were painted the same way. Uh, I didn't try to make different value leaves since this is more of a beginner project. Uh, your uh, base of a leaf that's extended like this is dark in the shape of the bottom of the leaf, as you see right here. And then all of my tendrils, my stems that come up to the leaves here, are done simply by base coating first with the village green, then adding just a little bit of the other two greens to them. And the tendril, I just got that in with the village green and then skimmed along it here and there with one of the darker greens. And then, of course, I picked up that wild rose one more time just to touch it here and there. Notice that here, while we're looking at this now, here's my golden highlights that I've added to my roses, and you can see the lavender in these other areas. See the tint that you may not have even noticed before, and the tips of my leaves have the accent colors. This background that you see on here, which is sort of a watercolor technique background, has been done using the color float, and it was done similar to the way we did the center of the rose. I dampened this area first with the color float itself, then went back in, started with my color here, and just kept walking it out on my brush. Picked up the next color, which I chose green right here, did the same thing again, and notice how I was able to blend these together as I went. Again, it's because of the color float that I was able to do that. 
I really enjoyed showing you the rose today. I hope you learned a lot from it, even if you're a seasoned painter. Uh, they're really a lot easier than you think once you learn the construction. So take the time and practice, and I know in no time you'll be able to do beautiful roses in acrylic, and especially if you use color flow.